Afternoon. Hey everybody. I think we are on time. Um, you're very welcome to this session on country integration stories. We've got four quite fascinatingly different cases. Um, there isn't really a much of a common thread through them. Um, except they're all in some way relating some kind of lesson around integration. Um, thanks particularly to all the our four speakers who all uploaded their presentations on time. Um, so we got four presentations today. Henry uh, is going to talk to us about their experience in Tanzania with integration with gen expert machines, which I know is a huge, huge interest for lots and lots of people, particularly TB program um, around the place and the like. We have Klohang Moaketsi from Lesotho, who has a very interesting story to tell about integration of DHIS2 with, with uh, WhatsApp via Rapid Pro. Um, and then two sessions which which touch on an area which we probably is a little bit new for us in DHS2. DHS2 has always been historically about routine data um, and routine systems. The whole area of emergency response. We've got a we've got a presentation. I know Niluka has been joined by a colleague remotely as well for part of it. Um, and then we have. I had, it says Adrian here, but Adrian's not here. We have a whole team. Uh, Whitney will, I think, lead us off and introduce us to her co-presenters as she goes along. Um, if you want to stand here, it's fine. You have the microphone and you can just stand. If you like to move up and down, that's also good. But we have a portable mic you can just pick up and go. All right, other than that, timekeeping, we're gonna to try to be a little bit strict on, we'll try to keep it to 20 minutes. Uh, if we do that, we know we're gonna have a good bit of space at the end um, where we can have a little bit more discussion and interrogation of the speakers. All right, so everybody clear. Henry, are you happy to kick us off? Yeah. Cool. Okay, we need to find your presentation. Yeah. Which is your presentation? Are you going to stand here or are you going to? Sir, it's here. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Henry, when we get to about fifteen minutes, I'll stop. All right. Now, do I navigate through this? It's on. Uh, I can just have. Uh... Yeah. Oh. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Kalisti. I will be presenting uh, one of our case uh, on integration between DHS2, TB, and Lepros tracker with the Gene Expert machine. Basically, of course, this you might be aware of this that t tuberculosis is one of the highly infectious diseases, uh, where about a uh, quarter of the world population is actually infected. Though, uh, out of those who are infected, it's five to ten percent of the people who actually develop to the uh, TB disease. This is as per the WHO findings. Um, 
<clears throat> TB is preventable and uncurable. Uh, usually it is treated using antibiotic. However, it can be fatal in case uh, the treatment are not done on time. So uh, the testing of the TB is usually done by a various approach, but one of the uh, crucial approach that is being used is the gene expert machine, which is the rapid molecular test. Um, and the good thing about this test is its capability of also detecting resistance to antibiotic, in particular rifampicin, and just within two hours. So uh, the issue that we we were actually working on is uh, the fact that uh, despite the ability of the next party to be able to test as fast as possible, but still an issue has been on having accurate, timely and complete diagnostic and logistic data from these uh, laboratory machines. And the reason behind this is, of course, the expert machine mostly are installed uh, in a particular designated facilities. And usually they are less than the actual number of the facilities that they are in place. So you may find one gene expert saving uh, multiple facilities. That is, of course, an ideal situation, meaning that cases of TB or samples of TB are collected from one facility, probably transported to another facility for testing, and then the results are being recorded. I mean, the results being also transferred or transported back to the particular facility which was requesting. So here, that is where the main problem uh, starts, um, whereby health workers are then forced to manually transfer this data from the gene expert machines um, to the particular electronic system. Uh, in our case, it is DHS2, it's here. So this uh, lead to the issues with quality, such as uh, receiving incomplete inaccurate and usually late data for the patients. Uh, while definitely uh, once someone is diagnosed with TB, must start in treatment immediately because any delay can of course result in more uh, transmission of the particular disease. So um, our main responsibility was to try to explore an alternative approach. Uh, and this is because of course, it yeah, doesn't mean that there is no approach to linkage between the expert machine and uh, other system, but probably the one that were in place, they were somehow facing some other challenges like economic of scale, uh, issues like privacy, local context, etc. So the, the, the need was to come up with an alternative approach that could of course help to address all of this. And what we did is to um, engage by using the participatory design approach uh, where we were lucky enough to encounter uh, this NIMRI or TIFA project who among their objective were also to establish the linkage between uh, uh, the gene expert machine and the, and the, the case-based system so that they can uh, fast track the issue of getting results. So while we were trying to find out a way we can do such a proof of concept and then the opportunity came. So with the little resources that we had, we collaborated so closely with the laboratory people and the national TB program from Tanzania. And our case was to deal with, to start with the 10 color modules, the next part machine. So four of them. What we wanted to achieve is, of course, to have one, a situation where, as per the diagram, you can see, usually the, the usual setting is you have the gene expert machine, which normally comes with the GX software installed in a particular machine. But then you have the electronic system, uh, in our case, which is case-based system, that is used to register the, the TB cases uh, from the facility. So the concern is how then you, you will be able to obtain this data from, uh, from these machines which are in the facilities. An obvious situation is, of course, they will have to be connected somewhere 
to the router where they can be accessed online. But the issue is how then you will be able to read these results from them and being able to push the results and link them to their property uh, case in the uh, in the DHS2 uh, case-based system. So um, what we managed to do is, of course, to come up with an interfacing adapter, or you may call it a system, uh, that you can, of course, either uh, install it direct within the same machine that is having the GX, I mean, the GeneXpert machine installed, or you may install it um, in the in the DHS2 instance, the one that ha is having the case-based system, or it can also be an independent uh, system that is aiming to pull this result from those multiple gene expert machine and send them to the central uh, DHS2 instance. So after managing to do this, the next thing was of course to make sure they are linked with the particular uh, case within the DHS2 uh, system. So uh, simply the features is to, um, the communication is we relied on the standard architectures and protocols to make sure that it is generic enough to be able to uh, be adapted in any situation. So we are actually using the normal communication protocol to PIP. Um, and as I said, you can install in the same or separate machines. It has a very simple UI that will allow the user to be able to do this uh, initial configuration for the linkage without a need for technical expertise. And then once configured, the, the adapter will be able to start transferring those approved results. Of course, it supports both automatic and the uh, on-demand use uh, for the transfer of those results. Um, the technology used, um, of course, um, make it uh, or support it to be uh, purely open source. And the good thing is also it is multi-platform um, based on server client architecture. The pushing of the data is definitely uh, independent of the external, I mean, of the adapter itself. Um, and the good and the user will be able to either log in straight to the particular uh, interface, but they they are also able to log in directly by using the, the, the external application, which is linked to, for instance, in this case, the same access that uh, you would use with the DHS2 instance, you can use it to do to access the adapter and then be able to push it, the data accordingly. So uh, this is just a, uh, a snapshot of uh, the simple UI that is used. Uh, once login, you can connect, and then after connecting, the syncing can start. Of course, the appropriate status of whether it is uh, not synced or it is already synced or there is any failure, uh, which is a very simple interface for any user who is even non-technical to be able to uh, maintain or manage. So the synchronized results. Uh, and this is one of the very crucial parts, apart from just the linkage itself, uh, is the linkage of the results itself, again, to the appropriate case within the DHS2, uh, in our case, DHS2 ETL. Uh, basically, once the results are, are moved, they are linked to the appropriate case, and then the, the user will be able to find the results uh, in the appropriate tracker stage. For example, this is the tracker which we are using to keep the case for TB. And that is the stage for re, uh, results, in particular the DST results. So the results that you are seeing there are actually automatically pushed from the uh, gene expert machine. So we believe this is one of the approach that can help to solve those issues that I mentioned about the accuracy, but also to have the result right in time. So um, among the achievements that I have already highlighted, Technically, but the, the most important thing is that ability to come up with that interface for transferring the data. And the good thing, it doesn't only support the diagnostic data, it also supports the logistic data for maintenance of the gene expert machine. Uh, and 
what we are much more happy about is uh, after this proof of concept is the opportunity we have ahead to engage the uh, more stakeholders so that we can scale up and connect all the expert machine uh, so as to strengthen the TB program uh, MND through accurate, timely, and complete diagnostic and logistic data, as well as maintenance of the gene expert machine through the timely intervention. Um, so our very future thing that we want to uh, to to complete to accomplish so as to have a full scale solution is to have um, a standard uh, centralized the dashboard uh, within DHS2 that can be used as um, as a standard metadata package, let's say, uh, to support the linkage between the next part and DHS2 so that uh, the testing data as well as the logistic data from the machines to be able to be managed within uh, same dashboard. Of course, as well as supporting other technology, the serial and FTP, as you may encounter some other gene expert machine using uh, other old technology, and this can be an alternative. Thank you for listening. Ah, no, there's no link in the slide. Uh, <laughs> Yes, of course. Hmm? Testing, definitely. As I, I mean, the, the one that I've showed here is the actual things. Testing is done on the bench. By? One study has the multiple testing. Mm. One study. And we find problem with the link to the batches with stretches. Mm. Under the software. Well, of course, if I mean, I will appreciate it if you can accept me introducing my colleague who is uh, who can go more technical in this. Yeah. <laughs> so please. Yeah, just if it's. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, we understand that the uh, different gene expert machines have different modules uh, that can. I take multiple samples to uh, being tested uh, at once. So what we re we relied on is uh, each particular sample is has its own ID uh, that's supposed to be punched in uh, the machine. So during the synchronization process, that is a unique ID that we use to uh, interact with the DHIS tool to know what to track the entity instance is and to go into a specific stage that taking is a, the result. Yep. So you are controlling for the DHS tracker with the, the for the testing as well, the, the sample collection and send for testing, no? Yeah, we we were limited to, 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 to just take the data from the gene expert to DHS2 right. as per the project so, or requirements that we had. But now we are experimenting on how we can get uh, the samples being registered from the ETL. Uh, but uh, there's an advantage of our module that we, we, we came into advantage of, of is we have integrated it with smart machines that don't need to register the sample into the machine. You just put the sample and it scans the, the barcode or the lab number. So when the results are released, the electric module can link. But for uh, the gene expert machines that we have in Tanzania that are not smart enough to scan on their own, then uh, lab scientists have to enter the sample ID. And then after the result at least, we can uh, definitely link to DHS2. Is there another question? Yeah. 
Very similar workflow, uh, I guess. Um, Jake Salat, right? Yes. Yeah, as I, that's why I mentioned in my presentation, it's not like there is no solution in place, but the challenge that we had was in, the, in terms of economic of scale, as well as uh, issues related to privacy and local context. Yeah. It's very good that we have this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to have to move on to the next presentation. But I mean, what, what, you, what you guys have done is, is really in demand. A lot of people are looking for it. And the, that final connector bit, you know, the bit that talks HL7 to the, to the machine, to the Gen DX. That's the bit that you always find is proprietary. Well, you get lots of people. That's really exciting. I think people will want to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. One last question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need to have a, a lab machine session. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We'll we, we, we do it at six o'clock with the rules. Yeah. But there's a few different approaches. And, yeah. But thanks very much for showing us what you've done. <laughs>
uh, 90.1, 91.5, 96.5. Um, and when it comes to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we had our first case reported in May of 2020, of 2020 uh, largely due to um, lack of testing facilities in Lesotho, so we, we, we export testing. So we, we, we delayed to detect any new cases of COVID-19 in Lesotho. And um, total cases that we ended up having is 34,000 and deaths that were reported were around 700, 706 uh, as of May 2023. And uh, we, we, we launched our vaccination uh, uh, program in March 15, 2021. And um, so far, individuals who have received um, recommended uh, primary dose uh, as of the 4th of June were uh, 945,000 uh, and coverage among the 12 plus population who are the people that we are currently vaccinating is uh, around 60%. So you can see the map there shows you how Lesotho is. Uh, how Lesotho is. And, um, so maybe I should also talk briefly to you about our um, experience, ICAP experience in uh, supporting and management of information systems in Lesotho. Um, DHS2 based integrated HIS de um, uh, was developed um, and the HIS covers 12 uh, health pro like the 12 health, health programs that our HIV, H HIS, HIV health information systems. It covers <laughs> twelve health programs, and we 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 are DHS two is actually operational now in one hundred ninety nine facilities. When I say one hundred ninety nine, I'm talking about the public public uh, facilities in the in the country, and some private. Uh, and we have a an EMR at client level uh, electronic medical system. We are using Bamni for that, uh, which we also supported uh, implementation. Because Lesotho is very small, we are in about 93% of the health facilities in the country. So we are implementing one EMR solution in all the facilities in the, in the country. So we're actually pushing that um, to cover the 199 facilities, uh, but we, we can comfortably say that around uh, over 90% of our clients who are currently on HIV program in the country, they are covered in the, in the EMR solution. So COVID-19 system was uh, developed for it's a tracker-based system that was developed and rolled out when the when the vaccine program started in twenty in, in, uh, one, and we call that system. Uh, within that system, the it's it's a tracker-based system, and within it, we also have our IFE program. It's also a tracker, a tracker, a tracker uh, program inside the inside the same surveillance system. Sorry, inside the same reporting system for for COVID nineteen registry, and we also. Um, did a rapid pro um, based active IFE uh, surveillance tool, and that is our focus for today's uh, discussion. So um, let's talk about uh, because our our presentation is is largely focusing on on integration. Uh, we want to talk to you about how the systems are are linking. So we have um, Covax system, which is the registry. Is, it, is, it is a DHS2 tracker system. We are using it both on laptops and on, on tablets for remote uh, facilities. And when we are doing like campaign work and um, we have all the vaccines that we are, we, we are, we are currently uh, uh, providing in the country, like your J&J, &J, uh, Pfizer, Sinopharm, Moderna, they are all, they are all in there. And um, it, it also captures like detailed demographic data of the clients, uh, like their names, their, their ID information, their mobile numbers, they are, they are covered in that system. And uh, we have also uh, included like census data so that we can be able to calculate things like your coverage for uh, vaccination in the, by district, by, like for the whole country. That is why I'm able to say that we, are, we, are, we have covered like 60% of the 12 plus population because we have actually just post our data with the with the central server, uh, central census data. And um, in terms of uh, interoperability of the DHS2, once you see COVAX, think DHS2 because the COVAX system is the DHS2 system. We have uh, integrated that system with what you call citizens app uh, because we were actually using citizens app for generating uh, vaccine IDs, especially for, 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 for people who are traveling outside the country. 
um and uh later we we had we, we changed to uh what you call a trusted vaccine uh, for printing those same certificates and that process required that we we correct and have correct mobile numbers of clients within our system because otherwise it was not going to generate a certificate if your mobile number is incorrect so that was an advantage uh, it was an advantage to our system to improve on the data quality in terms of num mobile numbers that we have in the in the system there so we our COVAX system uh, or the surveillance system that we were running in the country is, had, had some limitations in the sense that it was uh, since people have to come back to the facility report we had limited numbers uh, because it, 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 it was more like of a self-propelled system where people have to come when they feel like they have a side effect and report you can imagine that if someone felt like it's a minor thing they will not come back so we'll never get that so that was a, that was an issue and we we ended up in a situation where we have a number stalling for for a very long time this this is like a country countrywide dashboard that shows you like the number of IV cases reported in the, in the whole country so the whole country has reported like 1300 cases and for, for you to get to this 1300 uh, cases it has been like a two years process to to get the data so it's very slow because it depends on people coming back to uh, to report the IFE and then the, the, the people they find in the facility having the willingness to also uh, function the data into the into the into the system so uh we we learned of the of, of rapid pro and um we built on that platform uh to to develop a a more um uh, active open source cell phone based community level surveillance tool and the aim of uh, the aim is is to complement that our passive system because you remember i said we have a very passive system that depends on clients, clients having to come back to report when they have IFIS. And the numbers are not coming in, so we want to be a little bit innovative and try to pull the numbers to come into the into the system. So we are looking for a way of pulling the the data from there from the from the from the people who are, who may have uh, IFS. So we thought of what if we implement a solution that calls people from the from the community to report when they have a case right from where they are. That is where this uh, SMS SMS. It's, it's sms Bob, Bob, to, it, we are not using uh whatsapp <laughs> we are not while our while rapid pro is able to to use whatsapp uh telegram and other and other uh, uh technologies we prefer sms because in lesotho people don't have like a lot of people don't have smartphones so if you were going to go whatsapp then you're going to be limited in terms of the people that you're going to be able to 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 to, to, to reach out to so that is why we use we are we are we are, we are, we are sms is actually a deliberate choice uh, to, to, to resolve that uh, kind of problem so the system um it, it, it it's automated in the sense that once you are registered uh, and I'll, I'll show the workflow once you are registered in the in the dhis2 for your routine immunization the data gets pulled from the dhis2 instance from the from, from the tracker into rapid pro so there's like an automatic process that you have uh, that you have done there to pull the data from the uh, from from the from DHIS to instance into the Rapid Pro, which will then manage the workflows of sending uh, SMS to, SMSs to our, our clients. So DHI, the, the, the purpose of Rapid Pro is to manage things like your workflows, when to send an SMS, which SMS to send to which client on which day, and when should you stop, what is the criteria of to exit the workflows, and stuff like that. So Rapid Pro, Rapid Pro manages all that, uh, uh, all that, all that, all that work. So the so it was in, it was quite important that we integrate DHIS two with the with the with the with the, with the Rapid Pro uh, instance to, to to manage that uh, to manage that process. So the workflow is like uh, our client will go from the oh, now I can move from here. So our, this is our client here coming to the health facility, and uh, once they get to the health facility, they 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 get vaccinated and they have to wait for some time. I think you know the process that the WHO standard they have they have to wait for some time after that and while they are waiting the data gets captured into the dhs twisters that that is our covax uh, system so then there is uh, this this is our 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 we have put like a small uh, i don't want to talk about, i want to talk more about that but we have put a little uh, software in between uh, just to help us to pull back data from from uh, dhs2 because when we were pulling directly from dhs2 we were struggling to pull like back bulk records directly from from dhs2 so we had to put like a, a small plug there uh so i don't want to talk about it a, a lot because it is not yet like available to everyone to to use but it's a small python tool 
that we we did just to to be able to be to, to pull bulk data from the from the DHIS2, and that's all it does: pull bulk data from DHIS2, and then send it to to Rapid Pro. So Rapid Pro will do all the workflows inside there, and um, it will send like introduction messages. Um, I'm trying to be. Uh, I, I can. I can always come back. I'm. I'm trying to be careful about the time. So uh, we have our DHIS2 instance here. This is where the way everything starts because Lance gets registered here, and then uh, so that small Python uh, code. What it will, it will do? It will take like all the demographic data that is required and key data elements that are required from the from the things like your, like your contact number, the vaccine that you actually took, the dose number, and things like that. And then it will send that data into, into, our, in, into our Rapid Pro. And then Rapid Pro then will use Canal. So Canal is like your SMS gateway. Uh, so the, where you are able to send the messages now to the, to, the, to, to the clients. And when the clients respond back, they respond back through the Canal. And then the, the SMS gets registered in Rapid Pro. And then Rapid Pro, then we are, it is no longer using this. Rapid Pro then straight, will, will straight send the data into, into DHIS2 a tracker instance that you have developed. So the data is now available on the, on the dashboard for, for everybody to, to then see it, uh, to see it central, at, at central level. So that is, that, that is like a quick uh, a depiction of the, of, the, of the workflow. Um, so with uh, with this uh, system, I, I didn't really want to call this conclusions, but uh, because <laughs> I was, because we have just started, so we don't have like like real tangible stuff to tell you at this stage because we we just started. But I thought we can we can communicate about things that like the potential that we see, like uh, the next steps and some of the things that we think we can be can we can, we can be able to achieve from this. So with this tool. Um, COVID-19 vaccine recipients can, can report any presumed uh, IFIS in a timely manner from the comfort of their homes. Because the system actually, after you're vaccinated, the system automatically sends you a message. Hi, congratulations, you're vaccinated. How do you feel today? So something like that. And then the client can, can, always, uh, can always respond by, and then it will ask some, something like, after you're vaccinated, how do you feel? I mean, I'm, I'm just, talking stuff yeah I'm, I'm not talking about the communication science but something like how do you feel today after your vaccination and the client can be able to say do you feel like you have any any anything are you feeling any pain anywhere today after you're vaccinated and the client will then respond to that when once they respond the system like the 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 the, 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 the rapid forward flows will then be determining whether this is an ife or not if it's an ife then it possibly the checker that is how uh, that is how it uh, it works so the client receives an SMS, that they respond to the SMS. Of course, we are paying for the SMS, so they don't have to worry about the cost of the, of the SMS. Um, and so um, if, if, the, if the client then feels they have any, any, any IFE, they will report back on the SMS, and the, and the, and the, and the system will, will, will send it, the Rapid Pro will send it to, to DHIS2. So integrating Rapid Pro with an IFE uh, tool to, uh, of the DHIS vaccine registry, can be scaled beyond COVID-19. Obviously, with COVID-19, for example, we have cases of people that have vaccinated. They have not yet received their boosters. We have their mobile numbers, but we are, we are not able to remind them at the moment. We just know that we have this list of guys that have taken the first dose. They're supposed to take the booster dose. They're not coming back. So we are, we, we, we are seeing potential in this system that we can be able to remind those clients to, to come back so that we, we have like a pooling effect for, for, for our clients to, to, to come back. But even beyond beyond COVID nineteen vaccination, we are also looking at scaling this to other to other systems like other vaccinations. Uh, we have children that are being vaccinated, uh, and sometimes we have like a very high dropout rate of certain vaccines. So we are thinking of actually using this at at large scale within the within the EPA program to cover other vaccines. But even beyond that, when you think about things like your know, bigger HIV program. We have clients who, who are coming for HIV care treatment uh, services that we need to remind of the appointments for, for picking up their medications. We are already thinking of that uh, uh, as, as, as we talk uh, so, we, so that we can be able to integrate this system with our EMR solution so that clients can be reminded of their, of their appointments as, um, as, as, as things go on. That is where the Ministry of Health is currently at. They want the system, so this rapid pro to also be used in those other uh, use cases that I've just mentioned. Uh, now, I think I went really fast. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> sure, I'm here. <laughs> All right. So I'm from Ethiopia, and we have similar system in place. And one of the issues we are facing is reporting APIs to WHO's database, and we have been we have not able to integrate with that. And clinicians have to, you know, report manually uh, to WHO. So, do you have similar experience, or do you have any plan to integrate this with the WHO VGFlow app? Thanks. <laughs> And maybe to, I, I guess the, the question was able to go to the audience, right? I don't have to repeat it, right? Do I have to repeat the question? Or it, it, it was able to go through? So I can continue, okay. So we are not yet at that level. So at this stage, we were actually answering the question of pulling the data from the clients. And then we can later worry about sending it to, to, uh, to, uh, to how, how to interface with, with, with the digital system. Uh, WHO system. But at the moment, um, our priority was to pull the data from the client so that we can have the data at least at Ministry of Health le level. And then we can be able to talk about how the ministry then reports to other stakeholders. Yeah, but we are not yet there. Just wondering, um, since we capture this as plain text data from the, from the, the clients, um, so, like, say if they have a skin rash or they have fever or something after the, uh, do you have a separate and uh, separate coding step inside Dishas Two where you can assign the correct codes and everything and do the coding part? You know, like following the WHO um, guidelines for COVID reporting, um, or, or or do you just capture it as plain text if they have another other adverse effect, uh, adverse reaction? Yeah. So. Uh... I mean, when when we 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 using a coding system, but it's a local it's a it's, it's a local coding system based on our DHS two instance. So um, obviously, when they report, for example, like I said, we will be we will be asking a question like, "How do you feel today?" And that line will be, we 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 have tried to limit the so that our answers are structured because you you can imagine that the level of literacy of our clients is it's not the same. So you you want to avoid situations where they have to type things in. So the 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 data elements that are within DHS two are already coded into some into something that they have to respond something like one two something like that even for yes and no they have to respond, respond something like one and a two and then we have mapped that into the DHS two data elements uh, so that uh, when they report the SMS well we know that for this particular question one responds something like headache and then headache the code for headache will be this so it's linked to to, to DHS two like that yeah oh yeah. Welcome. Uh -huh. Anyway, you'll hear me. I'll I'll speak loud. So, um, good afternoon. So, um, I'm Nilu Kavijekun. Uh, I'm a medical epidemiologist uh, working for WHO Emergencies Program at headquarters in Geneva. And today I'm also joined with my um, colleague, Marcel Wong, who will also join and present some of the slides. And um, so I lead a project called Evo Cinebox. Um, you must have heard about this tool. Uh, if you have worked in an emergencies or in any of the countries you work has gone through uh, emergency. So now you had the first two presentations about more of routine, 
peaceful times or things that you can do in a more methodical manner. Uh, where we work, uh, this tool is about early morning alert and response, about priority communicable diseases, basically to detect outbreaks. Uh, where we work, uh, there's always a huge population displacement following a natural disaster like tsunami, cyclones, floods, volcanic eruptions, or in places where the uh, surveillance system is overwhelmed by large outbreaks like uh, West African Ebola or uh, cholera in Yemen, uh, where, where the reporting mechanisms are quite overwhelmed, or that uh, you also want to know what are the cases in the community through alert mechanisms. Or in other places like Northern Syria, uh, Northeast Nigeria, there is uh, conflict or violence, or there's no state actor. So we have to work with non-state. Uh, so, so the tool is by WHO, WHO is mandated to make sure during an emergency that we detect outbreaks early. So while we have so many other surveillance principles, the tool and the mandate is in an emergency to detect an outbreak early. It's not about understanding the case burden, the seasonality of the disease. This is entirely to detect an outbreak early. Because as you know, during an emergency, the risks are high. So if there's a, there's a threat, it will spread rapidly. So uh, this is a very joyous moment for us because the tool has been in operation for nearly eight years since the West African Ebola. Uh, but this is the, the first time we are integrating that with DHS too. So um, I will take you through some of the strategic uh, components and uh, my data analyst, Marcel, will take you through some of the, the uh, our experiences in South Sudan and DRC and how we move forward uh, uh, as we go into production. So um, how do I move now? <laughs> this here? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the tool is, is really a simple, rapid, and a flexible data reporting mechanism that can be established in a field setting, which has gone through a disaster very rapidly. So basically, it's an Android mobile app that can collect data, and I'll take you through in any location. We are not fixed on primary healthcare level or uh, fixed facilities because you can't find them all the time. So it can be a, a primary health care clinic, it can be a mobile clinic, it can be a health post, or it can be a community health worker or a volunteer who's reporting. It can be a community leader, religious leader as well. So it's a very simple and a rapidly deployable. I'm talking about few days. Uh, uh, that's the rapidity because emergency work, if you, if you know that there are certain standards that we have to be abide by, uh, we cannot set up something, train something if it takes one and a half months or three weeks to set up because that's good enough time for an outbreak to spread. So the tool is, um, so in emergencies, we have in other programs, this kit concept, you know, the cholera kit, trauma kits that can be sent to places where, where there is an earthquake or, or floods. So we also take this, kit concept, that's why it's called EVOS in a box. So it's an early warning alert and response in a, in a, in a box basically, a kit that can be sent, which will have the mobile phones with the app and um, a laptop for the surveillance office. And we most of the time know in these places during any disaster, whether it's conflict, war or natural disaster, there's no electricity. So there are solar chargers to, to charge the phone as well. I will go through quickly because, uh, so basically what happens is uh, there's data collection from various locations, from the field, and even from the laboratories. And these laboratories are not the type of sophisticated referral laboratories that you spoke about. These are the field labs, which will usually test basic key priority diseases and also connecting with the response teams. So we manage alerts at the surveillance office, the support is given to the surveillance office at the web interface to manage the alert. And we use WHO guidance for this. And these are not just alerts where you send an alert with a phone number. This, this is the full alert management as per the protocol. 
uh, that people go through the risk characterization, uh, identifying the outcome, taking samples, et cetera. And also we have features that will allow uh, the surveillance office to, to analyze data. So the dashboards, um, and also if you want to do uh, your own reports, the reports are automated. The basic idea is that you collect data uh, uh, rapidly, whether it's through indicator-based surveillance system or event-based surveillance system, and that you can analyze data rapidly for response. So the epidemiologists and surveillance officers have more time for response activities, not for data crunching. And when there's an outbreak detected, the tool also provides support for line listing so that you can do if there's a corona outbreak detected, they can also do the line listing and you, they can have uh, outbreak reports, dashboards prepared. So that's the kind of the tool that we have and it has been in operation for quite some time. Um, so basically, so we, as I said, we've been uh, in um, implementing since 2015, um, quite number of places, and we also support number of Pacific Island uh, countries for Pacific syndromic surveillance. But here for the, the new feature, uh, we've selected South Sudan and DRC. Uh, South Sudan has been one of our initial uh, implement uh, in, uh, places where we have implemented. We started in camps and then um, because South Sudan is a protracted crisis uh, for a prolonged period of time, it is one of the operations where we have more than uh, thousands health facilities reporting. And DRC, we have five provinces reporting to EVOS in a box because it is also in, uh, in crisis, um, a protracted crisis as well as number of outbreaks happening. So, um, so just to highlight why we are integrating EVOS in a box uh, at these stages, if you look at emergency data, so in, when an emergency happens, you don't have the normal structure, there's population displacement to IDP camps, refugee camps, the health clinics are managed by either UN partners, INGOs, NGOs, not the normal uh, surveillance structure. Most of the time, the data is lost. Even when there's an outbreak happens, it is sits, the data sits in Excel files of somebody's uh, hard drive, uh, and that data is not incorporated to the national system. Previously, we had a feature that just allows import export of data. So anyway, uh, whatever the HIS system in the country can have um, data back to the system. And it is also one other um, um, most important thing is with DHS2, you collect quite a lot of other sets of data that can be used for response activities uh, um, in an emergency. In some countries, uh, we may want to know about your wash facilities or nutrition or the bed capacities that can be used uh, for better response. So these are the reasons why we wanted to um, integrate. And um, um, we will talk about the way forward uh, after Marcel, we'll take over and discuss a little bit about the, the, the uh, experience. Uh, Marcel, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hello, I hope you can get me okay. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, so I will start with the technology behind the tool. Uh, basically, it was uh, has uh, uh, some few components. We have uh, a web uh, interface that is uh, the main interface where we are managing all the features of the tool, uh, either from the surveillance office, from uh, community health workers. We have what we call the country instance because it is a multiple uh, country tool, uh, such as GHIS2, it can be used for uh, uh, many countries. We have uh, the standalone server. Actually, in some places in the 
previous uh, sheet uh, Niloka presented, we have Ireland. And in Ireland, it is uh, important to have uh, a system that can collect the data because uh, access to the internet and uh, access uh, to global connection might be challenging, especially during emergencies. We have um, a mobile app that can be installed on, on a mobile phone that will be used for managing uh, data and it can also be used for processing information uh, based on the fact that sometimes uh, the data collected might generate alerts that have to be managed by surveillance officers in order to see what are the risks associated to the public health events that are reported. We also have an SMS gateway mobile app, which helps uh, for the user. We, the user will be reporting directly uh, to the system, uh, but the system will use the SMS to report because most of the time in emergencies, uh, it might be uh, an earthquake or a disease outbreak, the places might not be accessible with the internet. So we can use uh, the available 2G network to communicate. So for technicalities, uh, the module has been developed in, uh, using Python 3 and above. The front end module has been developed using React JS, uh, and uh, then uh, we are using GHIS2 API uh, for communicating with GHIS2. It is also important to note that uh, for the system, there are inbuilt API to communicate with other systems. So basically, no matter what the system is, uh, it can be uh, a, another uh, HIM, HIS, it can be uh, a simple code or a visualization software, it can be used. So for the integration process, we are using three types of uh, data set. We can have interval-based aggregated data set that uh, are adapted for epidemic prone diseases. It might be daily, monthly, weekly. We have uh, immediate, immediately notifiable data like uh, diseases of uh, immediate notification based on the HIR, H, IHR uh, regulation. We can also have the alert. Actually, it was uh, has a system of alert based on the threshold on the national guideline of countries, where when the threshold is reached, an alert is generated into the system that needs to be processed to see how data can be handled. And uh, we can have uh, as, as well case-based data or line list. For example, we can have information about uh, even based surveillance. So for the general principle, the data can go to GHIS2 aggregated model if it is interval based, or it can go through the tracker model using event program or tracker program. So uh, the user have the ability to configure all those elements uh, himself to see where he wants the data to be. And uh, it is, uh, this, the feature is integrated into the system. We can move to the next slide where we have uh, two key components of the process. The first component is uh, the mapping of reporting locations. Uh, given that it is two independent systems. And uh, the second uh, key component is the mapping of reporting variables uh, that will be formed. Next slide. So what is the integration process? Given that uh, Niliqua explained it uh, earlier, we might have in an emergency, a situation where temporary health facilities and uh, IDP camps have been uh, set up and then we EWAS is collecting data from those places. We have integrated into EWAS a process that will uh, handle all the data and push to GHIS2 in the right place. So basically it will be 
in a five-step uh, uh, process with creating a project, connecting the GHIF2 instance of the country, mapping location and variable, and then finally pushed. Let us have a quick look at uh, how it works. So basically for us, the process has been completed, already completed, and uh, it has been tested in uh, the two, in two cases we have the tested it uh, with GRC, with South Sudan. Uh, basically, uh, we are using some WHO guidelines to prevent uh, access to the data for unauthorized personnel. Uh, so these uh, uh, authentication feature shows how easy it can be to just enter the server, your GHIS2 server URL, the username, the password, and then the system will log automatically to select the data source and uh, to select the type of program we want to in, into GHIS2 and uh, then to see how we can push. Let us have a, a quick, uh, we can comment this uh, sheet uh, for one minute. So basically for the push configuration, given that uh, we know that uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, outbreak prone diseases or immediately notifiable diseases. The person, the surveillance officer can configure into the EWAS system how often he wants the data to be pushed. Uh, it can be on daily basis and he can select a time frame and uh, he can even decide to push the empty form based on the availability of internet and the size of data to be uh, integrated, to be pushed uh, from one system to another. Let us move to the next slide, please. So what, yes, next slide, please. What can be the uh, gaps on the opportunities uh, of improvement? The first one is, uh, the inconsistencies of common identifier for uh, location that is uh, in uh, GHIS2, so it's called organizational units and disease variable. In that case, uh, in the EWAS system, it is possible to handle it where we have prepared a CSV mapping. So rather than mapping it from the system variable to variable, we have a, a CSV mapping that can be done so that it can be used uh, uh, to map the two systems. And uh, the second uh, challenge might be a clear vision on how uh, the country uses uh, uh, once to, the GHIS2 will use alert uh, data for outbreak. Uh, it is worth to note that alerts data are dynamic, so it changes very uh, quickly and uh, pushing those data from one system to another might be somehow challenging. Uh, sometimes it might be just analytics on the processing that needs to be pushed. It is also important to explore options uh, uh, for integration process and uh, seek for local expertise in countries. And uh, we expect to have this participatory approach of communication for the EWAS GHIS2 integration roadmap. Right? Yes, thanks, Marcel. So just, uh, yeah, just, uh, just three things I would just say. So um, going forward, our plan is, so once we have uh, just this, this activity is in process, so once we know that we can integrate EVOS and DHS, so the next step is to strategically think whether we can also talk about this as part of readiness and preparedness uh, in countries where there's HIS system as well as it uh, can be affected by em emergencies, and also to liaise with the DHS to trim for, for further capacity building and training as we do for emergency uh, surge uh, teams uh, through WHO and other cluster partners and health actors. Um, and we also have plans to integrate the, the tool with other uh, platforms and tools like contact tracing, GoData, HERAMS, uh, other emergency tools. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. So, uh, I, I think we can take a question while the other team is set up. 
some questions over there. I think you can ask. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just going to help them here. Yeah. It's very interesting. How do we get over this? Skin to skin. So this is great, but my question is related more on the implementation. I don't know if you guys implemented this and have reports, okay. emergency mm -hmm. outbreaks, and so on. So if there was any decision made based on the data coming out of this system, it would be great if you can mention. So the other question I have also is like, do you use fully this electronic reporting or do you use hybrid, like the manual and of also the electronic? So a little bit more about on the implementation. Thanks. Yes, so Definitely, definitely. Yes, so we, um, uh, yeah, the Ebola outbreak, the management, the use of the management, and by that, for example, yeah. uh, Boko Haram crisis. Yeah. 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 Chikwad, yeah. this is yeah. Chikwad. Yeah. Did they quickly send you the slides? Sure. It's, it's Chikwad or DHS2.org. Mm -hmm. So, Chikwad. Uh, all our information after rapid action. So it is never Sorry about that. That's not the point. Like uh, you know, they had switched our session around, so maybe that that just uh, in places where there is no connection, we also no have SMS point. gateway app so that uh, that you can uh, you can have the the, yeah. the the reporting done in the the mobile, but yeah. it converts the. Uh, uh, the uh, report to well on SMS and again at the web interface received. So it's basically um, we we want uh, rapid reporting, so we encourage the Android uh, app use. Encourage you to, if nothing, uh, we have open WHO training, so it's free to everybody. There are 16 modules, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Polish, Ukrainian, in many languages. So you can, because we support uh, Ukraine uh, crisis as well. So uh, you can log into the enroll and log in and get trained. Thank you very much. Sorry, here you go. It's this email. It's that email right there. We get it very rapidly, I'm sure. I realized right at the start, I interested uh, And one of my roles is a little bit more. And a lot of these little cameos that we get, we won't really get the chance to dig into them. But um, we do meet every Friday, every Friday morning. Yeah got this running integration team meeting, which one of the things we try to do is to reach out to within the community, get people to share their important examples with us. So you might find Mohammed and Amy over the next few weeks, we will grab you again. Yeah. I think so. I think Martin was asking um, when these integration meetings happen and how to get involved. Uh, Martin, I think it's 10 o'clock every Friday morning. Um, 10 o'clock my time. No, 10 o'clock Oslo time. Uh, yeah. 10 o'clock Oslo time, 9 o'clock Dublin time. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very simple format of, of we just use Google Meets. Um, yeah, the easiest way 
just send me an email at bob at dhs2.org, anyone who's interested, and I'll just put you on a calendar invite, and then you'll get the notification each week. BOB at dhs2.org. Are we ready? Yeah. Sorry about that, Whitney. Yeah, this is great. Perfect. You ready to go? Already. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just, just a second. Let me be sure that the screen is being shown. <laughs> Didn't lose too much. Then we still have no, nineteen yeah. minutes. We'll, we'll <laughs> Okay, perfect. Well, good afternoon. Um, we like integration so much, we have integrated four speakers into our presentation. <laughs> uh, so my name is Whitney Peterson. I'm the first of the four speakers. Um, I work with Samaritan's Purse. I'm going to start us off and talk a little bit about um, from a program's perspective. And then uh, my colleague Derek will come on and talk about uh, from a business systems and project management perspective. And then we'll hand it over to Sarah and Adrian to talk a bit more about the technical specifics. Um, so yeah, I'll just briefly start. Samaritan's Purse is a um, faith-based nonprofit organization. We're based in the United States. We have 16 country offices um, and do programming in over 100 countries through local partners as well. Um, we do long-term programming through our country offices, and then we also have an international disaster response uh, division. Uh, so we respond to the disasters as well, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit today for the utilization of DHIS2 in our organization. We have um, started by targeting emergency medical responses. Um, and our teams that focus on emergency medical response uh, will respond to war and conflict, to sudden onset disasters, um, epidemic outbreaks, as well as population displacement. So a little bit of everything. Um, here's just a sample of um, some of our responses um, from large scale, full fledged tier three hospitals um, with multiple ORs and uh, 47 inpatient beds to smaller outpatient clinics, mobile clinics. Um, we'll do uh, training programs uh, as well as uh, a mobile surgical theater um, here in the bottom center-ish. Some of those end pictures are cut off, but um, is our Ebola treatment center in DR Congo from um, 2018. Um, and so I show this just to say um, the, the breadth of our programming is very broad. Um, the context that we work in are always different. Sometimes we have connectivity, sometimes we don't. Um, and all of our deployment systems are modular. So they can build on each other. We can increase the scale, we can decrease the scale. And so we really needed a, a data tool that would that would be able to adapt with that, that could operate in any of those contexts. and. Um, meet a variety of our needs. Um, so we also looked at the data stakeholders. Um, for us, that's everything from the program managers to um, our team at headquarters and really looking at um, who we're reporting to, uh, who we're accountable to. So if we have institutional uh, donors or WHO, Local Ministry of Health Partners, and wanting a data tool that could incorporate all those components um, while maintaining a standardized model so we're not having um, to reinvent the wheel every single time. Uh, that's really what led, led us to DHIS2. And our approach was, this, this looks a bit chaotic. <laughs> this is where the technical team comes in and, and makes our chaos um, something simple and usable for the field. Um, but here's just a sample of our paper general intake form. And um, that's on the right over here. And this is the form that we created that's actually all encompassing. So we use the same form, regardless if it's an outpatient facility, if it's a massive um, field hospital, like we just did in, in the wake of the earthquake in Turkey. Um, and so what we did is we looked at the key indicators that all of our primary stakeholders would want. So we looked at our internal indicators. We looked at the WHO minimum data set, which includes uh, reporting for the early warning system that we just heard about. 
Um, and also um, looking at our, our most frequent um, institutional funders, which for us is USAID and BHA. And so we created a form that encompasses all those possible indicators. And then um, our DHIS team was able to, to map those out um, so that regardless of, of what type of response we're doing, if we're being funded, externally or internally, it's innately in this form somewhere, whether we, we choose to utilize that um, output or not. Um, the possibility and the data collection on the front end is there, which makes it really scalable for, for every type of response. Now I'm going to hand it over to Derek to talk a bit more about the business side. Speaker number two. Um, um... <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Derek Blaylock. I'm the IT program manager for Samaritan's Purse for our international ministries of which, um, international projects, excuse me, ministries of which Whitney is a member. Um, I was, for this particular project, I was also the, the, pro, the project manager. I want to talk a little bit about the business case. I really want to get you to the technical solution, but I want to talk a little bit about the business case and uh, really how we, how we were able to successfully execute this project. You know, when you think about um, an emergency medical response, wherever it may be. I'm, I'm, I'm telling this room, but uh, data management, good data management practices are absolutely critical. I mean, whether we're reporting to uh, internal um, constituents or um, our benefactors, or even for us to, to, to better make decisions about the, the program itself, we need really good data that we can, we can depend on. And our challenge was that we've had we had a tool that we've been using for quite some time that was based off of a spreadsheet. And so I think we all know the issues with running a very large organization on spreadsheets. We quite honestly, we've just gotten too large for this and all the other problems associated with spreadsheets. So what we wanted to do was build a, an industry standard, a, a, a heavyweight um, tool that would allow us to professionally manage this EFH anytime or any emergency medical response anytime we were to deploy. We didn't want them to have to worry about it. We could do some customizations and get it done quickly. We want to respond with an IT solution as quickly as they want to respond to, to people who are hurting. And so the, re the result was that we built a tool. We have a very good partner that's going to come up next. Uh, and I, I call them partner. They're not a vendor. They're a very good partner with us. Thanks, Siri. And um, they built a, a very nice tool for us that, that, that is supported on, on uh, our corporate hardware standards. DHIS2 is becoming a, a bigger standard as well. And so it's been a, a really nice tool that we've been able to deploy. Coming up next, uh, we've already deployed for, uh, for our emergency medical, also for a cholera response. Uh, we've got an Ebola template that we're going to plug into here to this, this core platform. And then uh, we've already done medical training, tracking, um, airlift, distributions, medical supplies. And then uh, we do have a cleft lip, pallet, and cataract program that's going to be using actually DHIS2, this platform, plus the Android app pretty soon here. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, you know, the reason we were successful is kind of this classic uh, project methodology of people, process, and technology. And in this case, it, it truly was a good partnership. We got we had the mandate from senior management that we needed to help solve this problem. We connected with our international health unit of which Whitney was our lead SME, had a great team who was involved in the requirements definition, um, testing, piloting, and, and the eventual go live. And of course, our partner who's coming up next, uh, EST, uh, built this thing for us. So uh, it, it truly was a good group of people working. Now, without process, we really had nothing. And that's where Whitney and her team came into play with good governance, really great standard operating procedures, and most importantly, enforcing those things in the field. Um, you know, whether it be uh, common uh, indicators or a standard form, they did a really great job. And the technology becomes easy when, when we have that. And then lastly, yeah, you know, it's, this is based on DHIS2, surprise, surprise. And uh, I think... Although support may not necessarily be considered technology for us, that was the most important. So we have, a, uh, or as important. So we had a, a multi-tier support strategy starting from our, I, our internal ICT country IT folks in the field, uh, coming up into our headquarters team where we triage issues, and then uh, third level support being our vendor. 
Uh, and we did that through a, a, a help desk ticketing system that uh, so that we have some some consistency and some standardization. And so that's it from the uh, the IT the, the 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 project side. I'm going to bring up Sarah to talk about the uh, technology solution. Thank you. So Sarah, speaker here. Uh, don't worry, Adrian is not going <laughs> to speak too. He will be here, but just to answer some questions if you have them. So I will be like the last speaker. So um, Adrian is the, um, the one leading the development of this application. So it's a pity he cannot be here, but well, I will do my best. And um, first of all, I wanted just to introduce you briefly the company behind the app. We are ICT and we work mostly in cooperation and health and research projects. Uh, we work a lot with DHIS2, but not only. And one thing that it's like very important for us is that almost all of our work is open source. So focusing on the application that we are going to talk about today, I just wanted to tell you that this application is part of a bigger context of emergency responses that we are building for Samaritans. So we have like uh, other apps that some of them are already working to. I mean, they are being used, for instance, the one for cholera in Malawi, and we have another one that it's been tested for Ebola and two more in development. In the case of the emergency field hospital, we are pretty happy because it's been used already by Samaritans into very important emergency responses such as the Ukraine war and the Turkey earthquake. And I think it, it went pretty well. So we are very happy with the results. And I wanted to highlight briefly the requirements of an app such as, such as us. So as Whitney was saying before, some of the requirements imply that sometimes when you are in the field, you don't have connection or you don't have a reliable connection. So one of the most important things was that it had an offline mode that it only not permitted you to capture data, but only to have already some visualizations tools that could enable you to analyze that data and take like better decisions in, in the field. So apart from that, as I was saying, we also wanted like a, a tool that it's very used to, sorry, very easy to use and very easy to install and configure and something very quick. And also I'd like to highlight that although it's a DHIS2 app, it's not only that, it's more like kind of a integral solution. So you get a laptop with, with Linux, with Ubuntu, and you can turn it in a, into a complete solution that you can take with you into the field. And it's a DHIS2 server that you can use to pull the data from the headquarters and also use it to, to push data. We will go into more detail in a little bit, but first I want to show you the application so you have a better feeling of what it is. So when the user goes into the app, this is what she or he sees. It's like mainly eight functionalities. And I wanted also to highlight that this is a mix of when we could use like a standard DHIS2 functionalities, we have used that I mean, no need to reinvent the wheel. So, but sometimes we need it, or either or custom sections, or we need it to use some of our generic apps to to go to the to the last part of the process. But some of, some of the features are just taken from the HIS tool, like the tracker or the visualization tools, like dashboards and so on. So we have here one very basic. A um, feature that is just like to configure like some kind of maintenance um, data. And then you have the intake form just to capture the data. And we have, as I was saying before, three tools for visualization. And <laughs> this is like the, one of the complex part to, to turn all this data into a, a report that is completely customized and it's pretty complex. And the user just have to click on a button and the magic happens. So I think this is, this is pretty great. And this is done thanks to a generic app that we have that it's open source that it's called Metadata Sync. Then we have also another module that is the training app to, to teach the user, even if it's very easy to use, if she or he needs to know how to use it. So we have this, this app that, by the way, it's also a generic app and won the contest here like two years ago. So you can take a look if you want. 
Um, as I was saying before, you have to have the ability to pull the metadata from the headquarters and to push the data. And this is just two buttons for the user. So this is really very easy to use. And then just to finish, I wanted to, to explain a little bit about the whole process. How do you go from a Linux computer to a DHIS, DHIS2 machine that you can use in the field? So you have several steps, but they are, as I was saying before, very easy and very quick. So first of all, you have to get your machine and you run a script. It's just a one line script. And this launch a website. So you have already an interface and um, a graphical interface that scares no one. And from there, you can choose from several dockers. So for instance, here in this case, you could have like the cholera outbreak app, but here we have like the emergency field hospital one. So you choose your docker, you click, and you have already like the skeleton for the app. And now you need the metadata because that's what can distinguish. For instance, I mean, you can be in Turkey in the earthquake and you can need some kind of metadata, or you can be in, in, Ukraine, in Ukraine and you can need another kind of metadata. So you have the skeleton of the app, but when you pull the data, you have like a customized solution. And then you have already your app running and you can use it to capture data and to visualize data. Here I'm presenting the two of the places where it has been already used, as I was saying, I think that pretty successful. And, and all this flow of data, as I was saying, for the end user is just two buttons, just pull and push. So that's pretty cool. And just to finish, I wanted to add that we have also like developed this homepage, like this landing page. So when a user goes into this website, depending on the permissions that, that she or he has, maybe she can access all the five apps or maybe just one of them. And this is done thanks to another generic app that Nacho is going to present on Thursday and it, it's in the contest. So take a look and if you like it, vote for it. Um, so yeah, I think it's also like, uh, a very nice way to present like the quick links to different components. And that's it. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you, Sarah, Derek, you too. Got a minute to do a couple of glasses. Uh, you want to ask one. I said at the start that it wasn't much of a common thread between the four, but there are <laughs> That's the bit that, that you left out, I think, but I think it was all more to Model on this side, but not on that side, all kinds of squiggles and red lines between the mapping part. <laughs> we really need better open source mapping tools. So I think in all of the projects, you, you're mapping rapid pro flow results. Yeah, to, and, and, um, yeah, in all the integration projects, you have that mapping thing. It's sometimes really, really complicated. Um, we've got some tool chains that we're developing, but um, also we're looking for a good mapping solution to make the job easier. But quick questions to the presenters before we have to unfortunately close. Sarah, you're, you're on the. <laughs> I'm alone. Come on. <laughs> Well, this particular module, I, I, I've worked with Ebola. Oh, sorry, thank you. I've been involved in some Ebola responses, and I know that there's often, um, like MSF is setting up hospitals and if Samaritan's Purses. I wonder if there's any collaboration across for developing some or collaborating on some of these modules. And then also thinking, you know, at the other side for the case management side, is there something that could be done to kind of bring these together or like, you know, in the Guinea outbreak that was happening, there was a module that was built on Tracker that was used for the, you know, in DRC. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of way to kind of collaborate across partners so that everybody's not developing their own system. Thanks. And do you want to? I, um, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I think the collaboration, I think, sorry, it was you that asked, yeah. Um, you know, it's, for us on the front end, we try to do a lot of preparation um, so that 
typically when we respond, it's within the first like 72 hours of an emergency. And so for us, we have to have that stuff queued up and ready to go. Once we're in the field, we hit up all of the health class or the cluster meetings, right? Which is typically how we collaborate and like happy to coordinate on the ground once that's there, you know? Um, and so that would be like my initial um, response. I think you had a second question as well, right? Well, it's just more about if there's coordination through, you know, with the partners we're developing the case management side of how to make and the Yeah. And then on the surveillance, are they sharing information with surveillance or are they developing their own system? And yeah, and especially with regards to surveillance, like ex specifically, that's why um, they were able to build that the MDS form because. Uh, the surveillance team, the WHO, who leads the surveillance, wanted um, that form submitted in a very particular way through an Excel document. So they were actually able to to make that as part of an app and um, enhance our like immediate collaboration on the ground so that there's no delay in that reporting and that, that coordination is there. But I mean, to speak to your point, I know that you get you're with MSF, I assume. No, I'm no. actually with CDC. Oh, we okay. often <laughs> myself in the field. And yeah, and I think that we're so happy to start collaborating. I know they've been using um, DHIS for, for a lot longer than we have. And for us, historically speaking, our Ebola response in the past in DRC and Liberia, we weren't utilizing DHIS2 yet at that point. So we're looking forward as we're newer in the DHIS2 realm to see what the collaboration looks like in real time among actors on the ground. Sorry. We all have to go, and I was going to close down, but I, I, I'll give you the last word <laughs> before, before we thank the four presenters. Um, I think there is a lot of way of collaboration and coordination across different partners in the countries. And I so I'm from WHO, and I'm working on the health data analytics and also part of that was the health data collaborative that we also as a secretariat and I think this is an area especially surveillance and country sort of integration of different data systems and how we support the country strengthen the capacity and data use um, this is one of the area maybe we there is a health data collaborative different working groups and surveillance is one of those working groups but also we are um, trying to see how we can work together in the countries. And maybe this is something we can touch outside and, and, and have discussed further. But this is one of the areas really important when we don't go in and set up a new system and then, um, and then we leave or does the system collapse or having a multiple system in the countries that nobody can use and share the data. And I think this is one of the reasons why we started to work together a lot so across different programs in WHO and, and on, on that concept. So maybe we can touch um, outside later. Thanks. We're starting a fight now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I, what I love about where this has got to, and I know we all have to go, but, but a, lot of, a lot of people tend to think that integration is about getting computers to talk to computers. Generally, that's the least difficult problem, and integration in terms of, of human beings and partners and organizations is where it all starts, and that's the theme for next year. Right. Thanks very much. Big hand for the four presenters.